episode of Surviving the Cataclysm. Vestin has a good question. He asks, what should I do if I'm surprised by a zombie in an unexpected situation? Well, the key to surviving the cataclysm is to always be aware of your surroundings so that you are never surprised. As long as you can avoid a zombie getting the drop on you, you're in pretty good condition. Oh, fuck! The post-apocalyptic zombie genre of games these days can often be considered a standard affair. Slow-moving zombies that shamble around and chase players that get too close. Maybe some developers add in a few alternate zombie variants, or even zombies that can sprint. But what you often don't see are hordes of Lovecraftian zombies and other strange creatures chasing after your custom-built vehicle capable of punching through walls. Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead is one of those games that took the genre in a different direction. With nearly 10 years of community contributions and development, resulting in one of the largest open source games out there, today we're going to take a look at where it all began and how it's evolved over time. Before getting into Dark Days Ahead, let's go back a bit further and talk about the original game that it comes from, a game called Cataclysm a zombie roguelike survival game developed by Zachary Jenkins, better known as Wales. The original version that Wales made was pretty far removed from what Cataclysm would become. Rather than being a randomly generated post-apocalyptic simulator, this was a much more straightforward, survive crossing a zombie infested town going from point A to point B sort of game. Think NetHack meets Left 4 Dead, as these two games would serve as the main inspiration. It was reportedly pretty simple, and according to Wales, only took about 15 to 30 minutes to complete. This would prove to be a good starting spot for a much larger game, and noticing that there really weren't that many post-apocalyptic, let alone zombie survival roguelike games available, Wales would begin shifting the game in a slightly different direction, one much less linear with more of an emphasis on exploring and survival. And so the first real version of Cataclysm would be born. Eventually sharing this game that he had created, it wouldn't be long before Cataclysm began to attract the attention of the roguelike community, namely Dwarf Fortress players on the Bay 12 forums, who saw the game as something of a post-apocalyptic version of Dwarf Fortress's adventure mode. As for what the gameplay was like back then, most of the details I've seen from people describe the game as being a slightly more unforgiving roguelike compared to Dark Days Ahead. Progression was heavily focused on exploration and looting to obtain gear as opposed to crafting it. Base building didn't have much to it yet, as Wales imagined the player being a nomad rather than remaining stationary and creating a fortress. Plenty of modern features like bionics, mutations, and crafting existed, just in much simpler forms. NPCs were deadly and even had to be removed at one point for reworks. Lovecraftian creatures were added to the map to add some variety, and the difficulty reportedly increased the longer the game went on, as zombies dynamically spawned based on factors such as sound. Wildlife would zombify, acid rain was much more deadly, and overall, there was kind of just an expectation that players were going to die. Development largely seems to have steadily continued between 2010 to 2012 without much issue. The game had been open source from the beginning, allowing for a modding community to grow and contribute to development with things such as vehicles, although Wales would be the sole individual in charge of primary development and determining the game's future. And it was here that Dark Days Ahead would start off, as just another mod looking to add more to the survival experience. Not much about what the original mod specifically added seems to have survived, but we can still see that the two co-creators of the standalone Dark Days Ahead version the Darkling Wolf and Kevin Grenade had pretty active modding threads on the old forums. Come late 2012, the community of Cataclysm would be presented with a significant dilemma. Despite the growth and attention that the game was receiving, in late 2012 the word was out to the community. Wales was no longer intending to develop Cataclysm. Despite earlier in the year Wales discussing numerous plans and goals for the game in the long term, development had clearly been slowing down, with mod developers somewhat taking over the role of adding new features with their own work. So, why would Wales want to move on from such a successful project? Well, he got a job. More seriously though, this was only part of the reason. 
Cataclysm had been made at a time in Wales' life when he found himself unemployed and able to dedicate hours every day to development. But now that he was working, between creating new features, fixing old ones, and managing the community, there wasn't enough time to do everything. Combine this with a growing feeling of burnout and declining passion for game development, Wales was just ready to move on. And so, everyone was left with the question of what to do next. If Cataclysm was going to have a future, someone would need to fork the codebase and take over development on a new branch. This is where a modder by the name of Kevin McCavern, better known as Glyphgriff, would begin reaching out to others about organizing a team to continue working on Cataclysm. After some discussion, a new plan was formed. Glyphgriff had more experience working with websites, so he would establish a new webpage and forums for Cataclysm to be continued under the Dark Days Ahead name, while the Darkling Wolf and Kevin Grenade, along with other contributors, would handle more of the programming and organization of game development. Under the team name Clever Raven, Cataclysm would be forked onto a new branch. Many members of the community would follow Dark Days Ahead to their new website, viewing them as the leaders of continuing Cataclysm. And like that, the new team was on their own. These early days of Dark Days Ahead being on its own would have some challenges to overcome. The team had to adjust to a new structure for adding features to the game as people started falling into positions of leadership, and questions began to arise over what direction development should take. On one side, some contributors felt the game should be providing a simulation experience by focusing on realistic sounding features and gameplay. On the other hand, some people held an opinion much closer to Wales' development beliefs, that while realism was good when possible, if realism would result in tedious or unfun gameplay, then compromises should be made. Naturally, there were plenty of disagreements and arguments over features, but for the most part, balanced compromises could be reached. Although interestingly, one of the most heated and contentious debates from this time reportedly had nothing to do with the realism debate. Note, the biggest argument occurred over whether milk containers should be called carboys or gallon jugs. This was also a period where the community was seeing a large amount of growth. Dark Days Ahead may have been new to developing on its own, but word of their work attracted more ways of players, and before long, the game was going from receiving only a few hundred downloads per month to a few thousand. Looking at the first few stable patches from this time period, there really isn't too much to talk about. The first update, version 0.1, came out on February 26th, 2013. You did have a few non-version updates before this, adding features like item disassembly, chain link fences, and various bug fixes. But 0.1 was the first official version update. As for what was added, we get to see a whole four lines of updates in the change log. Palisade and log walls, ripping clothes into bandages with your hands, and a revolving shotgun. 0.2 was similarly light on features, but brought about one major change. Zombie spawns could now be set to static rather than dynamic. Previously, Cataclysm would spawn zombies around the player based on factors such as noise, meaning that it was possible to clear out an area only for more zombies to spawn and attack the player. But now, zombies could be set to spawn upon world generation, resulting in worlds starting out more dangerous and becoming emptier over time. Version 0.3 finally had a bit more substance, although this could be in part due to changelogs finally being better maintained. As for the actual contents of the patch, aside from smoker zombies, more tools, players spawning with a pocket knife and lighter, and the great carboy versus gallon jug debate finally being resolved, most features appear to have been sensible fixes, adjustments, or other minor additions. 0.4 would continue this trend. Item disassembly fixes, power armor, technical improvements to map tiles allowing them to hold more items, and basic professions. Really, the game wouldn't see its first major patch until version 0.5 released on May 14th. Compared to previous stable releases, this one was actually pretty big. You had world gen updates with new buildings and ruined vehicles, the ability to learn recipes from other sources besides books, file changes to allow for better mod support, visual UI improvements, robust genetic and dodging adjustments so they'd actually work now, and a whole host of new items, skills, and rebalancing. 
and those were just some of the main highlights. You had a new hardcore trait for masochists, weather radios, artifact improvements, and you could now actually die from thirst and starvation. All of this was a massive step forward for the game, showing not only was the main development team focused on adding more items and features for people to discover, but they were also concerned with improving accessibility through backend improvements, something that can often get overlooked due to not being as fun or interesting to work on. Writing the success of a patch like this and making good use of the growing player base, this presented the perfect opportunity for the Dark Days Ahead team to launch their next plan to bring the game forward. Sobering news of mobilization north of the border, we've actually got rumors of multiple unconfirmed strikes on targets in the northeast. It's a pretty dark day, folks, so stay safe out there. There may be darker days ahead. On June 21st, Clever Raven would launch a Kickstarter for Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead. It may seem confusing at first as to why a game like Cataclysm would put up a Kickstarter. After all, not only was the game already out and freely available, but it had plenty of contributors supporting development. So was this just a case of developers asking people to give them money for the work they already do? Well, not exactly. The development team would explain on the Kickstarter page that this Kickstarter was about jumpstarting a new age of Cataclysm development. A problem that has plagued the game over the years is that the frequent experimental updates created difficulties with working on long-term projects. Many new features and adjustments in experimental builds can easily set works in progress back by days or even weeks. What the team needed was someone they could trust to sit down and make some much-needed features happen before the experimental builds got too far ahead. For this task, they'd be employing one of their developers, Ethan Kaminsky, also known as Sauron, to develop a variety of key upgrades to the game, including full tileset graphics for those put off by the ASCII art style, Z-levels for more interaction between in-game layers, and proper mod and world managers. With a goal of $7,000, Sauron would be able to dedicate three months of full-time development to creating these features for Cataclysm. But, if they could raise more than this, then they'd be able to contract him for an even longer period of time. Stretch goals included things like a scenario editor, stealth, vision, and inventory rewrites, and even merchandise if they raised enough. Overall, these changes were focused on technical revisions and improving accessibility, rather than just adding more items. Despite complaints by a few individuals over the idea that a free-to-play open-source game was trying to do a Kickstarter, most people were supportive of the project. And just three days in, the Kickstarter would be halfway funded, with the remaining 50% being given over the following week. In the end, this endeavor would prove to be successful, raising a total of $9,492 to hit one stretch goal and fund three and a half months of development. There was one little issue though that almost caused a major setback. Shortly after the Kickstarter began, no one could get in contact with Ethan Kaminsky. Not only had he disappeared, but reportedly, members of the team tried getting in contact with his family to see if something had happened to him, only to learn that they hadn't heard anything from him either. This guy completely vanished, and I don't think he's ever reappeared. Luckily, another member of the community would quickly step up to fill the position. Sean McLaughlin, also known as Galen Evil, would take over as full-time developer, in part due to his background as a freelance game programmer. With a new developer found and the money raised, now the pressure was on to deliver the promised features. While the Kickstarter was going on, Cataclysm would end up receiving two major updates. Version 0.6 released on June 22nd brought with it highlights such as Zombie Revival if they weren't properly butchered, gasoline siphoning, new buildings such as cathedrals, prisons, and mysterious cabins, 
zombie spawn density changes based on surrounding buildings, vehicle physics, and the usual bug fixes and other improvements. Smaller additions included things like rotten food changes, so it would no longer magically become fresh upon being cooked, new missions, deadlier radiation, power armor variants, and professions now containing skill support. Following this, 0.7 would make its way into the game less than a month later on July 16th, just before the Kickstarter ended. This update was setting up a few text changes behind the scenes for translating the game into other languages, something we'll start to see in the next few stable patches. As for actual gameplay features, the big highlights here were plenty of new add-ons to the Bionic system. Flashbang generators, railgun modules, the artificial knight generator, and plenty of other modules were all added in here. You also had the usual features like more crafting recipes, more guns, bug fixes, and quality of life updates like quick saving and a configurable auto pickup feature. Moving into the post-Kickstarter era, the goal for the next few patches would be about delivering on the Kickstarter objectives. Tile sets, Z levels, a modern world manager, and the stretch goal of a scenario editor. Fast forward to September 16th with the release of version 0.8, players would see the first feature from the Kickstarter make its way into the game. You had some big features for this update including additional farming support, new world generation options which allowed for adjusting city size and monster density, backward save compatibility, as well as making use of the text changes with translations into Russian and Chinese. But the big highlight this time was the addition of tile sets. The ASCII art style may have contributed to faster development without needing to worry about art and animations, but it often came at the expense of accessibility. Looking at Zs moving across the screen and trying to determine what type of zombie they are isn't always easy for new players, and plenty of people had stated a refusal to play the game purely because of the graphics. You technically had ways to implement tile sets before this point, but now they were being officially supported without needing any roundabout installation methods. That being said, it was still a work in progress. Not everyone was a fan of the new tile set sprites, with some players who had grown used to what the game looked like sticking with ASCII. And especially on the experimental builds, you could find cases of tile missing placeholders. It was an important step forward for sure, but one that would need continued support and improvements. Moving on to version 0.9, released on November 15th, this release would come with another of the Kickstarter features, the World Factory which allowed people to manage multiple worlds. The real highlight though would be the sheer amount of new content and mutation category improvements compared to previous patches. You add blacksmithing to create your own tools, new vehicles along with a vehicle construction overhaul, bringing about new components for more reinforced and powerful cars, or maybe you'd prefer to ride around in a shopping cart, killing monsters with new flaming weapons. That was an option now. New weapons, new tools, new armor, and new professions. Throw in technical polish for better performance and more tile set options with Sue tiles, and you had a pretty hefty patch to cap off 2013. In less than a year, the game had brought in thousands of new players, thousands of new features, and launched a Kickstarter. Overall, a successful first year on its own. Cataclysm's first stable release for 2014 wouldn't kick off until March 2nd, with the release of version 0.A, also known as Kaufman. The time span between stable versions was increasing, but that didn't mean development had slowed down. In fact, there were more contributions being made than ever before, enough so that the patch notes could actually be divided into proper sections rather than just highlights followed by everything else. Kaufman's highlights this time included things like the long-awaited mod manager with enhanced mod support. You also had full screen mode that was now available. You had more mutation changes including branch thresholds and post threshold mutations for crazier outcomes. There was a long asked for feature in mouse based movement and look controls, fishing, and working refrigerators. As for some other notable minor features, Guilt from killing monsters would be reduced over time as players slew more creatures. Matches and the pocket knife were removed from player spawns due to being a little too useful. Most zombies were buffed to half more HP, energy drinks could now be found, 
more buildings, more mod support, and the usual balance adjustments. Several months after this update would mark the one year anniversary of the Kickstarter. Quite a few of the promised features had already made it into the game, such as the World Factory, Mod Manager, and Tile Support. But there were still two features missing, Z-Levels and the Scenario Editor. Progress on the Scenario Editor was going well, but Z-Levels appeared to have had a few issues along the way, leading to some major delays. The team still had about $2,700 left over that could be used, resulting in the decision to place out a bounty on the website Bounty Source, with the hope of finding a programmer willing to perform the necessary work for Z-Levels to function. They'd managed to find someone willing to take on the task, but there was still a long road ahead before detailed Z-Levels would be added and fully functioning. Some of the rewards for backers were also still a work in progress, as NPC updates were being waited on before adding in custom names. Lastly, in one of the final updates for the Kickstarter, senior developer and web host Glyphgriff would also announce his departure from working on Cataclysm, although he would still continue to manage the official website. After successfully establishing the game during its first year, release fatigue was starting to set in for many. Version 0.B Brin wouldn't be released until November 17th, but once again brought with it a large list of new changes, notably containing over 9,000 new commits. Highlights this time feature speed improvements, both in how fast zombies moved and speed as in performance quality, more buildings to explore such as motels, warehouses, malls, pizza parlors, and bandit camps. You had more options to configure difficulty through the newly added scenario editor. There were additional mutations making players more bird or bear-like. You had new items like grappling hooks, fishing traps, and e-cigs, and plenty of new guns to use. Players could also now do things like brew alcoholic beverages, wear tools, keep weapons and things like holsters or scabbards, there were plenty of new NPCs with new missions, and you can now get killed by a variety of new monsters including wraiths, exploding gas bag zombies, and riot control robots. Seemingly getting into a new cycle of time stable releases, the next version 0.C Cooper would be released the following year on March 11th. Featuring a new monster infighting system with monsters belonging to various factions, Cooper also brought about the death cam system so players could see the aftermath of what ended a game. There was a new aiming system for guns, allowing players to take their time with aiming shots for additional accuracy. Tailoring kits now had options to add patches and insulation to clothing. New turret options were added for cars to create mobile death machines. And you had better performance for large bases containing thousands of items. The game had really been doing more to assist with massive hideouts that players might want to create as opposed to the early days. You also had rifle straps, fire engines, more clothing options, buildable concrete and brick walls, expansions to the farming system, quality of life improvements like being able to salvage everything on a single tile, and a lot of bug fixes, like doors and windows no longer being the only thing holding up roofs. Once again, another massive patch to start off the year. But unknown to many players at the time, the Cooper update would be the last official stable release that Cataclysm would see for the next few years. Release burnout had certainly been an issue for the team, and trying to organize thousands of adjustments, thousands of new items, and various other performance improvements was proving to be incredibly time-consuming work for what was still a small volunteer team of trusted developers. People were just getting busy with real-life responsibilities, resulting in a struggle to fix all the necessary parts to launch another stable version. The next official update would come eventually, but no one saw the need to rush as the experimental builds were still being updated daily. This did lead to some players questioning if the game had died or if development was discontinued, but for many players, they knew if they wanted new features, all they had to do was download an experimental build that didn't crash every 5 minutes, and they were probably good to go. Additions continued to be made, bugs would be found and fixed, and eventually a code freeze was put in place to finalize features. But for nearly 4 years, there wouldn't be another stable version. Outside of actual game updates, a few other things of note were that Glyphgriff finally moved on from hosting the game's website in 2017, 
leading to a short outage as the rest of the team worked to find a new web host. It also appears that the team attempted to launch a development voting website around the time of Cooper's release, allowing the community to vote on features and fixes they wanted to see given more focus. However, not many people participated, eventually resulting in the site becoming unmaintained before shutting down some time later. Lastly, despite not receiving a new stable version in years, the game was still being picked up and advertised on a variety of gaming publications even receiving recognition in a large ebook project presenting the history of computer role-playing games. Time hadn't eroded people's interest as everyone patiently waited for more news of future development. Finally on March 8, 2019, the long wait would be over. To say version 0.D Danny was a big update is somewhat of an understatement. I mentioned that Bryn was considered a massive update with around 9,000 new commits. Danny, by comparison, had a total of 37,604 commits from over 700 contributors, and effectively doubled the number of items, monsters, buildings, and everything else that was already in the game. I'll cover what I can, but obviously, I might miss a few big additions. The big highlights this time feature things like quality of life improvements to auto pulp, auto pickup, and batch actions. There was a new pixel minimap for tiles mode a stamina stat for running and doing other strenuous activities, player faction bases existed now allowing people to make communities for NPC followers, vehicle overhauls to speed and fuel consumption, nutrition overhauls to better handle food spoilage, there were better NPC commands allowing them to more effectively guard areas, trade items, and assist with crafting, you had full translations into Chinese, German, Polish, and Russian, and nearly double the amount of existing in-game content. As for more specifically what some of that content was, we see the addition of things like horde improvements, allowing them to reabsorb monsters and move towards cities, guns accepting magazines, morale influencing crafting speed, you had improvised stone tools, forges, and pottery, tons of new creatures ranging from child zombie variants to acid ants, feral zombies, and elite zombie grenadiers carrying flashbangs, C4, and a mini new CAC, though this zombie would be removed in later versions. You had new map gen options allowing for cityless maps, new professions such as hunter, tourist, bionic survivalist, and more, new starting scenarios, new buildings like evac centers, vet clinics, and bike shops, dozens of improvements to the UI, menus, tile sets, and music, more mod support for editing professions and scenarios, and a massive amount of balancing and bug fixes. All of this is just a fraction of what made it into the game. For the people who had been away or didn't keep up with experimental versions, this was a massive amount of new content to explore. You did have one of the last Kickstarter features sort of make it into the game with this version, although it doesn't seem to be clearly listed and I didn't see the feature in previous versions, but that being the experimental Z layers. Detailed Z layers were a work in progress, and still somewhat are even in modern versions, but this meant that the promised features from the Kickstarter had finally made it into the game in some form. It also appears that an official Android version was released about a month after this update. There had been unofficial methods of playing Cataclysm on a mobile device for years before this point, but now people could play a slightly more optimized version on the go. Going forward from such a massive update that took so long, the goal was to have a new stable release available approximately every 6 months. Although, this attempted release schedule would immediately be broken with the next version. 0 0.E Ellison wouldn't be released until April 1st, 2020. The goal for this version was making the world feel more alive by highlighting features focusing on immersion and exploration. You now have long distance auto movement for walking, driving, and boating. You could ride creatures such as horses if you don't want a car or bike. There were more flexible base camp construction options. The default starting date for new games was now set to mid-spring to avoid spawning in the middle of winter. You had more location variety and building rooftops, crouching for stealthier movement, more scenarios such as the Person Island, NPC faction improvements with additional commands to further assist players, and turn times being reduced from 6 seconds to 1 second, resulting in longer days when traveling or exploring. 
you also had quite a few notable balance changes. Namely, adjustments to creature evolution, so you are much more likely to encounter a normal zombie in the early game, as opposed to being swarmed by acid zombies or other highly evolved monsters. Stamina and healing were also adjusted, with healing now being slower, and stamina management making it more difficult to charge in and fight a horde. Experimental Z layers were also a feature that was on by default now in the settings, after receiving enough improvements so they wouldn't easily glitch out worlds. The Ellison patch was also one of the first to receive further sub-patches over the following months, that appeared to have just been bug fixes and other minor adjustments, rather than fully fleshed out new content. And now we finally reach the modern day. Version 0.F Frank, released on July 3rd, 2021. The big feature included in this release was the nested container system that had been requested for years. Rather than just having a pool of items that make up your inventory, with a total storage weight determined by the bags you're carrying, items would now go in specific containers. So now you might put small items in pockets, large items in backpacks, guns in holsters, you get the idea. So no more cases of dropping a backpack in the middle of combat to reduce encumbrance, only to realize that the game decided to include your ammo magazines as part of the randomly selected dropped items. It still took some getting used to for many players, but at least it wasn't quite the buggy mess that it had been on the experimental builds. As for other highlights, in-game achievements now existed to show off accomplishments, with 363 achievements for players to earn. Players and monsters can now bleed as a proper wound system was intended to be added at a later date. You had plenty of weapon and armor value adjustments, as the update worked to make the game a bit more difficult compared to the Ellison version. You had flying helicopters, new monsters such as flying zombies, rust zombies, taser drones, and teleporting face skulker zombies. You had performance improvements, Z-level improvements to better interact with vehicles, and the usual thousands of new items, crafting recipes, traits, and more, as well as plenty of new features and supported mods. Just like the previous version, Frank would receive an additional three updates containing a large number of bug fixes, adjustments, translation improvements, and even a couple minor features such as a new auto-driving system with better pathfinding and unlimited map memory. So now that we're past that update, where does the game go from here? What about the future of Cataclysm? Version 0.G already entered a feature freeze back in May, so now it's just a matter of waiting on bugs and other issues to be fixed. If you're someone who plays the experimental builds, not everything might make it into 0.G due to this freeze but you can probably expect more items, more polish, and probably some of the older experimental features, such as mutation adjustments no longer being instant, map tile sets, power grids, and a long list of other items and features to explore. Honestly, it's tough to say what exactly a game like Cataclysm will look like in the far-off future, as people continually come up with new ideas they feel fit the game. Something like nested containers had been requested for years, until Corgent made it work after developing it over a two-year period. Even back in the early days of Wales, something like driving was believed to be too complicated until a member of the community one day uploaded a mod that made it work. The game obviously has its technical limitations that complicate some features, but a few contributors still managed to find a way to make things work. One thing I didn't really touch on was that Wales returned in 2014 to begin work on a sequel dubbed Cataclysm 2, with the goal of fixing Cataclysm's design issues through a tech rewrite. Besides performance improvements, it would have also brought about improved factions and even a discrete storyline for players to follow. The project never went anywhere, however, and while Wales has joked about Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead rebasing to Cataclysm 2, no one seems to have ever really pushed for Dark Days Ahead to consider switching over to a proper engine or undergoing a technical rewrite. For now though, Cataclysm will likely continue along with what everyone has come to expect over the years. Tons of new items, scenarios, and other features that add more to the world, along with some big surprises along the way. Maybe someday that goal of a smaller, more manageable release cycle will be realized, but for now, if you want to see what Cataclysm is up to, just go play the experimental build. If you enjoyed this video, then remember to like and subscribe. Until next time, catch you next time.